Hello, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our ALS Webinar Wednesday series. My name is Kelly Hall, and I'm a Marketing Coordinator for ALS North America. Our presenter today is Dr. Mitchell Herbel. Mitchell received his PhD in Agricultural and Environmental Chemistry from UC Davis and served as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois, U.S. Geological Survey, Stanford University, and the USDA in Riverside, California. Since 2006, Mitchell has worked at ALS Bioscreen, overseeing the analytical chemistry department. Mitchell has led field research projects in analytical method development, transfer and validation studies for pharmaceutical and personal care product industries. ALS Bioscreen serves these industries and is FDA registered. Now he serves as the technical director for ALS Bioscreen Laboratory in Torrance, California. And today, Dr. Herbal will be discussing the preservatives in pharmaceutical and personal care products. During this presentation, you may use your chat box, ask a question, or raise your hand feature to ask questions. All questions, though, will be answered at the end of the presentation. Mitchell, thank you for taking your time today. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me well. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Close out this uh, window. So here, um, the title of my talk, as Kelly mentioned, is Preservatives. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more into the analysis and current trends in pharmaceutical and personal care products. So first of all, I want to just let everybody know um, the information and views expressed in this presentation are solely from myself and do not represent any official perspectives of ALS Global Corporation Bioscreen Testing Services or any other um, company or regulatory agency. But I'll be presenting a lot of information from a variety of sources, so just want to make that clear. So the uh, outline of my presentation is pretty extensive, so this will be a pretty uh, full discussion today. Um, we'll go into why are preservatives necessary in regulated products, um, talk about some definitions, performance characteristics uh, for in choosing a preservative. Um, also go into the classifications of preservatives used in regulated industries. Um, go into the analysis of preservatives, both the chemical and microbiological uh, types of testing. We'll get into a fair amount of, on the regulations on the use of preservatives uh, in personal care products as well, so both pharmaceutical and personal care products. And then talk about some challenges and incentives for uh, obtaining some new preservatives. So um, first question is, why are preservatives necessary in regulated products? Well, the main reasons are that if uh, the primary and secondary strategi strategies for minimizing potential for microbial contamination during manufacturing and product use fail. So primary strategies are those that are used to ensure the protection of the product uh, by manufacturing under strict aseptic conditions to avoid microbial contamination. But that's not always possible. Um, you can design your, your setups and everything to try to minimize that, but it's very difficult to man manufacture large scale uh, products uh, uh, fully under aseptic conditions. So secondary strategies include proper packaging and container closure systems to protect the finished products by serving as a physical barrier to present, prevent contamination. So these are just some examples uh, uh, um, of both pharmaceutical and personal care products with their uh, packaging and uh, container closure systems. The other uh, main reason why we need to uh, think about preservatives is water activity. Um, water activity in the product is, uh, is, is also a very high concern, uh, such, such that if it's above a certain level, you may allow for microbial growth in your product. And water activity is the most important factor that can determine if an organism can grow and reach potentially harmful levels. And I'm looking at the classical definition of water activity, which is actually based on the partial pressure of the va vapor pressure of water in the solution or in the sample compared to that of pure water. So at maximum, you can get a water activity of one, and that would be pure water. <laughs> so anything <clears throat> um, uh, less than uh, pure water, you'll start getting lower water activities. And water activity in pharmaceutical and personal care products is often measured by a dew point hygrometer method, but can also be determined by resistive electrolytic and capacitance hygrometers. So these are just some examples of uh, measuring uh, water activity. They're small instruments, um, <clears throat> but they're very important in uh, man manufacturing labs. So. 
excuse me. So um, water activity in a product that could support microbial growth depends on the species. So a few bacteria can grow at water activities um, in the range of 0.8 to 0.9, while many can grow above 0.9. Some molds and yeast uh, can grow in water activity slightly above 0.6, and many can grow above uh, 0.7. So here's an interesting diagram from Decagon devices, which actually uh, manufacture water activity uh, meters. And this is uh, primarily uh, showing uh, water activity related to food, but I found it very interesting in that it shows water activity in the uh, <clears throat> x-axis here. As you increase water activity, your reaction rate or your ability to grow and, and have reactions happen increase. So bacteria and yeast above 0.9, uh, it's very easy to, to grow bacteria and yeast. Mold can uh, grow you know, at lower water activities. Um, and then this related to other food types of uh, uh, systems, browning reactions, etc. But I really liked this uh, diagram to talk about uh, yeast and bacteria. Now the USP um, has a couple of good diagrams in the general chapter uh, 1112. Um, what you see here on the left is uh, water activity, uh, minimum water activity requirements for certain bacteria. And as you see, almost all of them are uh, well above 0.9. These that are below that live in extreme environments. That's probably not common in, uh, in many products um, that we uh, are familiar with. Whereas um, uh, molds and yeast can grow at water activities uh, quite a bit lower. So those are definitely a very high concern uh, when you have um, water activity above a certain level. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting diagram as well that shows uh, water activity in some common products. Um, in na nasal inhalants and hair shampoos, et cetera, you get very, very high water activity, antacids, topical creams. So therefore, you really need to focus on uh, uh, doing pre uh, 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 preservative testing uh, to address the potential for getting bacteria in your, in your systems and such. Once you get to oral suspensions uh, and then uh, other types of products such as ointments, lip balms, compressed tablets, et cetera, uh, the testing needs are really uh, uh, significantly reduced. So that uh, um, is less of a concern um, when trying to come up with new products and submit them for, for sale. There's ways of lowering water activity, um, such as adding chemical substances to uh, disturb the cell membranes um, and lower the risk for contamination and or uh, enhance effectiveness of your microbial agents. Some of these things you could add are like humectants, which are sugars, propylene glycol, etc., surfactants, such as fatty acids, polyglucosides, gelling agents. And I like this diagram here, these diagrams that show sucrose, adding more and more sucrose to water the water activity uh, drops uh, quite a bit, but you have to add a lot of sucrose to really drop the water activity below that 0.9 region. The salts are also similar, you know, less bacteria can grow in uh, salty solutions than in uh, non-salty solutions. So as you see here, um, the sodium chloride increasing the percentages of water activity tends to drop. It's very important to realize that anhydrous products do not require any microbial preservatives. So if you know your product is anhydrous, such as powders or some kind of balm or something like that, that has absolutely no water, you should have a little worry of, any, of uh, microbial contamination. Uh, other ways of uh, controlling uh, uh, bacterial growth is uh, different types of emulsion forms and pH of the products uh, can be uh, adjusted to minimize micro uh, microbial growth in the products. So um, the other thing too is if your formulation is susceptible to damage by free radicals, such as exposure to uh, oxidation and light exposure, um, you need to add some uh, antioxidants to minimize free radical formation, uh, add chelating agents to maybe complex metals that may catalyze oxidation, limit the excipients that, has, that have oxidative um, impurities, such as polyazorbates, polyethylene glycol, which are formed by the ethylene oxide uh, attack to uh, open up uh, ring structures, et cetera. Uh, any residual ethylene oxides and such um, can really enhance oxidation. And then proper packaging to, and storage to minimize light exposure for the finished products. So um, the other reason why uh, we need to uh, 
test for preservatives and, and, and be very aware of them is that there are federal requirements. So the FDA does have extensive guidelines on expiration, expiration dating and stability testing for human drug products. So this is in the CFR, um, primarily for uh, the good manufacturing for uh, finished pharmaceuticals. And they do mention here the stability of an article to maintain its quality or purity through the use of antioxidants or preservatives must be well established and described. And we'll get into that a little bit more here. Um, for stability data, there are certain sections in the United States Code of Federal Regulations that indicate uh, the products formulated to contain preservatives to inhibit microbial growth should be monitored throughout their shelf life to assure the effectiveness of the preservative. Um, USP also has uh, listed requirements as well too, and the ICH Q6A um, has uh, quite, a, quite a bit of discussion on preservatives, way, way too much to list here. That's a whole another presentation uh, from ICH. So also, you know, not just the United States and North America, but also European agencies, the EMA or EMEA, um, uh, has a good discussion on antioxidants and antimicrobial preservatives in medicinal products, the guidance. Um, and for antimicrobial preservatives, um, and finished products should be assessed during product development using the um, European pharmacopoeia tests. And if the products do not contain a preservative and do not have adequate inherent preservative efficacy, they must not be packaged in multi-dose presentations without some justification. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but talk about packaging uh, later here. So um, they also have a uh, guideline on excipients in the dossier for application for marketing authorization of medicinal products, uh, talking about uh, Annex II uh, antioxidants and antimicrobial preservatives. So each um, antioxidant and antimicrobial and a microbial preservative in the application should contain reasons for, and, and justification for why you have it, proof of their safety, efficacy, the method of control in the, in the product, such as if you have synergistic effects, the levels on storage um, over time, and then details on the labeling uh, of, the, of the product. So all that must be included in the European um, uh, applications. So consequently, we'll, we'll get some definitions here. The role of preservatives are to prevent microbial growth and or oxidative degradations, degradation of actives and excipients in the products. Specifically for pharmaceuticals, kind of simple definition here, a preservative is a substance that prevents or inhibits microbial growth and extends the shelf life of the drug products. For cosmetics, I got a good definition from uh, Article 2 of the European Regulation 1223, which I'll get into a bit more pretty soon. Preservatives are substances which are exclusively or mainly intended to inhibit the development of micro, microorganisms in the cosmetic product. And, and antioxidants inhibit oxidation reactions involving actives and excipients that may form free radicals and peroxides. So those are some simple definitions, but uh, um, understanding how to address them as a bit more of a challenge. So we'll get into some uh, performance requirements uh, and characteristics of a suitable preservative, specifically focusing here on pharmaceutical drug products for the next few slides. An ideal preservative system should be, should include, should be able to meet that they exhibit antimicrobial activity against microbes listed in the pharmacopoeia test methods, um, very well-defined procedures. So that's the, the guidances that must be met. They must exhibit antimicrobial activity spanning the pH range associated with the product or device. They are free from irritancy, bitterness, or other sensory effects, do not adversely interact with drug or other components in the formulation, package, or delivery device, and maintain efficacy throughout the product's shelf life. So some other performance uh, requirements is that they exhibit antimicrobial activity against bacteria, molds, yeast, and fungi at low concentrations. That's one of the keys here is the low concentration. Um, also that the aqueous solubility exceeds minimum inhibitory concentrations over the product pH range and shelf life. So the solubility in the water phase is very important because the water phase is where uh, the microbes will tend to grow. <clears throat> and the oil or uh, non-water phase, uh, you don't have that as much bacterial growth. So getting the uh, preservative to dissolve in the aqueous phase is very important. 
Um, the preservative should also exhibit sufficient partitioning into the aqueous phase and multi-phase products to best assert the uh, antimicrobial effect throughout shelf life. Um, kind of says just what I mentioned, um, that they're chemically stable during manufacturing over the course of shelf life and at the end of shelf life. Um, they're compatible with other excipients and actives in the formulation and in the container closure system. You don't want to add a preservative that's going to react with the other components or the or the container and then just kind of disappear because then that'll allow microbes to grow even though you added it originally. So that's very important to consider. And of course, you don't want to add a preservative that's going to have uh, uh, unacceptable tastes or odors. So they, these preservatives should have acceptable organoleptic properties, particularly, particularly for oral, intranasal, and pulmonary administered products, and also non-irritating at the typical concentrations used. So we'll get into some of the chemical classes of preservatives. As a chemist, um, I really like to look at the uh, the formulations, the structures, and such, um, and and look at how they 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 all differ because one preservative can be extremely different from another. So chelating agents, those that are such like aditate, disodium, or pentetic uh, acid that has like a lot of fingers to grab onto and complex with metals, um, antioxidants such as hypophosphorus acid. Um, butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, tocopherol, vitamin E, um, and then other antimicrobial agents, which I'll get into in quite a, few, in a number of the next slides. So preservatives can also be broken down by source. So you have naturally occurring preservatives. So many of these preservatives have been around for quite some time, including formaldehyde, sorbic acid, salicylic acid, ethyl alcohol. <clears throat> many of them derive from uh, quite a few natural sources. Formaldehyde gets a bad rap, um, but I do want to mention that formaldehyde is produced commercially, of course, but also occurs naturally in fruits and some foods. It's formed endogenously in humans as a result of your metabolism. So saying there's zero formaldehyde, uh, you know, in our environment is uh, very wishful thinking because it's a simple compound that's formed in many ways. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, uh, there are concerns with formaldehyde, obviously, at higher levels, but it will have a certain background uh, concentration uh, in many systems. Other natural preservatives, essential oils. Um, essential oils are very interesting used for preservatives. Um, they're often very complex mixtures of other compounds, such here as uh, tea tree oil. If you look here, it's like nearly a dozen different compounds of very in interesting chemical structures. So uh, you start to get into, are these going to be compatible with our products or not? So those are some of the challenges by other natural, especially essential oils. And then, of course, the synthetic uh, uh, sources of uh, preservatives, organic acids, sorbic acid, benzoic acid, uh, dehydroacetic acid. You have the alcohol groups that include triclosan, phenoxyethanol, chloroputanol, the phenolic groups, chlorocresol, propyl parabens, many parabens, thymol, aldehydes and formaldehyde releasers. So we already talked about formaldehyde, but there's these other compounds known as formaldehyde releasers that are very commonly used. And they're complex structures, but when they degrade, they will release um, you know, formaldehyde, you know, slowly over time. So they kind of uh, uh, have a consistent formaldehyde background to help serve as a preservative over the course of uh, st the stability, the expiration dating. Um, other classes include the isothiazolinones. <laughs> See if I could pronounce that well this morning. Um, and here are some examples of MIT and CMIT. The biguanides, the chlorhexidine, um, and quaternary ammonium compounds such as BKC, benzalkonium chloride, quaternium 15, nitrogen containing compounds, this is iodopropanyl butyl carbamate, acetylperidinium chloride, um, heavy metal derivatives including thimerosal, phenylmercuric mercuric nitrate, inorganic compounds such as sodium metabisulfite, boric acid, and this is an interesting in my research finding that uh, there's silver chloride deposited on titanium dioxide or silicon dioxide can also serve as a, as a certain type of preservative in, in uh, pharmaceuticals. 
I want to note that many common food preservatives, such as why, you know, why don't we put nitrites in our uh, personal care products, but those uh, would be toxic in pharmaceutical uh, and personal care products. Conversely, common preservatives in pharmaceutical and personal care products, such as phenoxyethanol, will present a compatibility taste issue and toxicity issues, preventing them from being used in foods. So there is some overlap with the food industry, but they're generally quite well segregated, the different types of preservatives used for the different products and foods. Um, the USP, uh, you know, looking through FDA and other uh, types of regulatory agencies, they don't really have good lists of preservatives out there. Um, whereas the USP is uh, generous enough to have a section in some of their general chapters on you know, common preservatives for, uh, say, oral liquids. So they list, uh, you know, quite a few here that are commonly uh, used. So in terms of formulating your products, um, using these compounds in this list, uh, you know, if you have some background data uh, information on there, you know, the agencies are very familiar with these type of preservatives. Whereas the uh, natural oils and, uh, and such, you know, maybe they're not as familiar and you have more to, uh, to prove to regulatory agencies if you're trying to market a new product containing those different preservatives. Uh, for ophthalmic preparations, the list is quite quite uh, a bit reduced, not not as many uh, for some unknown reason. <laughs> I don't, I'm not an expert on those, that's for sure. Um, the USP also has exceptions list by functional category, including antioxidants. For oral liquids, these are the common antioxidants that um, uh, <clears throat> are referenced, such as sodium ascorbate, methionine, vitamin E, tocopherol, etc. Um, it's interesting, antioxidants can be further broken down, you know, characteristic wise. You have the true antioxidants that block reactions with free radicals. You have antioxidants that are just primarily reducing agents, such as ascorbic acid. And other antioxidants are just basically synergistic such as sodium editate. So it's interesting, each of these groups, you can break them down into different classes further. Um, now what I want to get into are the preservatives that are common in uh, pharmaceutical products. Um, and let's start with oral products. Um, you have the methyl ethyl propyl parabens, the benzoates, sorbic acids, and these are in uh, like the amino aryl acid esters, ar aryl acids. Uh, quaternary ammonium compounds, the QAC compounds. For topicals, you also have the QAC, you have metal chelators, oral alcohols, esters, so uh, fairly similar to the oral um, uh, compounds. Um, you also have organomercurials, formaldehyde donors, um, biguanides, uh, and phenols that are common. And parenteral, uh, including vaccines, and you know, those are the injectable type of products. Uh, a little bit more restricted with benzoyl alcohol, chlorobutanol, parabens still listed, benzoic acid, et cetera, um, chlorhexidine, uh, thimerosal, et cetera. The ophthalmics, you have the quaternary ammonium compounds, thimerosal, the organomercurials, biguanides, uh, formaldehyde donors. Etc. So that's kind of some general uh, guidelines on the different types of um, preservatives used in different pharmaceutical products. Now it's interesting too, from uh, um, also known like biogeochemists, so uh, looking at how biology affects chemistry is very interesting to me. Um, and so preservatives um, have different modes of action within the microbial cell. Uh, so you have those that are very active on the cell wall, such as phenols, organomercurials, glutaraldehyde, quaternary ammonium compounds. Within the cytoplasmic membrane, you know, right around the cell wall, interior cell wall, the parabens are very active, organomercurials, chelators, uh, the benzoconium chlorides, etc. And then in the interior of the cell, you have phenoxyethanol, halogenated preservatives, chlorhexidine, uh, formaldehyde donors, etc. So the preservatives will have different areas that they're effective in, in uh, managing and uh, in inhibiting microbial growth and division and such. So the, the chemistry, testing um, chemistry um, products for preservatives, 
evaluating that by the chemical perspective, you really need to look at, you know, the pH of the product and how the preservative pH-pKa relationship uh, exists. And so there's the Henderson-Hasselbalch approximation, which basically is the pH equals the pKa, the dissociation constant, uh, plus the log of the dissociated form of the product of the chemical and the undissociated. So the optimal pH uh, for microbial growth is between pH 6 and 8. Um, so formulating above or below that pH um, will lower the uh, overall growth of microorganisms. But basically the more undissociated fraction, the more in this phase of the preservative, the more can penetrate the cell wall because the uh, cells are very, uh, uh, have a very good uh, uh, ionic exchange across the cell wall. So those that are uncharged uh, may, may slip into the bacterial cell wall more readily than the charged species. So the effective ranges for parabens, uh, biguanides, and formaldehyde donors are in these ranges. So uh, a lot of them uh, are at the optimal range of microbial growth, but some of them are above and below that. So that relationship is important in evaluating uh, preservatives based on the chemistry. Also, based on chemistry, the solubility in the aqueous phase, you know, the chemical structure, the pH-pKa relationship, interactions with excipients. So the more soluble in the aqueous phase, the greater effect of the preservative, as mentioned before. And then the interactions with excipients, those can be very complex. You know, many personal care products have, you know, dozens of different ingredients. So you really need to do a thorough risk assessment of your preservative in your formulation uh, before you uh, proceed further with, um, you know, trying to trying to get the some type of approval or marketing of that. You don't want things separating out and or allowing bacterial growth. Um, interactions with other preservatives and enhancers, their synergistic effects, compatibility with them uh, should be well established. So formulators have a lot of challenging work when they are working with the excipients, especially if they're in brand new formulations. So. Of course, mentioning about a risk assessment, the complexities in formulating new drug products and personal care products are numerous and require a thorough risk assessment of the chemical and microbial aspects of the preservative options. These are listed in ISO uh, guidelines. There's one specifically on guidelines of risk assessment for microbially low risk products. ICHQ-6 also talks quite a bit about uh, risk assessment. You also have ICHQ-8, especially ICHQ-9, risk quality risk management. So just want to pr provide that background information on uh, risk assessment when you're working with uh, preservatives should be evaluated. So how do we analyze uh, preservatives? Well, first of all, you have the raw material. So for example, in the USP, there's a raw material monograph for ascorbic acid. And uh, you say, why do we have to do all these tests? Well, um, basically you need to make sure you can identify it properly by fingerprint type of mechanisms, FTAR, chromatographic retention time, matching, chemical performance tests, et cetera. You wanna make sure you know the potency or the concentration is what it should be. So you need to do some type of assay by chemical methods, evaluate the impurities that uh, may be difficult to remove in the manufacturing of the raw material. So looking at HPLC, GC types of uh, testing for impurities. You have many specific tests uh, to verify the proper pH, specific gravity, congealing temperature, residue, residue on ignition, uh, also including like bacterial endotoxins. That's a whole other uh, topic for a webinar, uh, endotoxin testing. Uh, and then of course it goes over uh, packaging and storage. So this is for the raw material. So now when looking at preservatives and finished products, you now have the whole matrix effects going on there. So it's gonna be quite a bit more challenging to analyze a preservative in a finished product. So really you need to look at sample extraction where you can extract the preservative uh, from the matrix, either like liquid liquid extraction or solid phase extraction and filtration. Some preservatives may require pre or post column derivatization such as those lacking chromophores like formaldehyde, ethyl hexoglycerin to increase volatility. Um, instrumental analysis um, after you do some separation or uh, derivatization. HPLC is probably the most common way to analyze preservatives because most of them are soluble in uh, uh, aqueous or uh, organic solvents, uh, but the detectors include UV-Vis, MS, amperometric, et cetera. Majority of preservatives can be analyzed with uh, C18 columns, reverse phase columns, or, or such as like phenyl uh, derivatized columns, 
others with high hydrophilicity, um, such as di diazolodinyl urea, quaternium-15, may require specialized columns, specifically like helic columns. Um, other ways of analyzing preservatives, if you just look in the literature, you look under GC for preservative analysis, you'll get a ton of hits. Um, flow injection analysis, there are many different ways to analyze preservative in different uh, products and formulations. So that's the joy of chemistry. If one method doesn't work, there's probably another approach you can take. Um, here's an example in our lab where we've used a phenyl column with a three-phase gradient that's able to separate out 16 preservatives for simultaneous analysis. So um, don't necessarily have to have just one specific method for each preservative. There are methods that you can use for multiple preservatives. And the center here shows separation of the, the propyl parabens and such, um, phenoxyethanol, uh, triclosan. This is just a, a raw chromatogram I pulled from the lab. Um, other types of preservative testing, formaldehyde, as mentioned, uh, there is the uh, total formaldehyde analysis that can be uh, use um, where the reaction generated by formaldehyde releasers after derivatization with ammonium acetate and acetyl acetone, uh, UV-Vis uh, spectroscopic uh, technique. So uh, still a little bit of work on the bench top, but you just have a simple UV uh, analysis that you would do. Now analyzing free formaldehyde, the, the formaldehyde itself requires some derivatization. And in our lab, we, we use like DMPH to uh, derivatize followed by analyzing on HPLC. So here's an example from the chromatogram from the lab that shows formaldehyde. It's kind of buried uh, behind the peak here. This is a formaldehyde peak, but these are other aldehydes and ketones. So if you have those in your product and you're derivatizing with a certain agent, you want to make sure you add your agent in excess so that you can make sure it's fully complexing with your key formaldehyde uh, species. So um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, this is also uh, common in environmental literature, such as like EPA methods and such. So now if you look at, um, as opposed to the physical chemical testing, the efficacy of the preservatives must be demonstrated on the microbial flora within the product itself. So just doing the chemical testing is not enough to ensure you're going to get antimicrobial uh, activity. from. So you need to really go into and test directly with uh, uh, the, the microorganisms that are of concern. So this is known as preservative effectiveness testing. Methods are in USP, EP, JP, PCP, ASEN, ASTM, ISO, so many methods listed out there. Um, but the most commonly our lab is using the uh, uh, USP, EP type of uh, testing. Um, and then from USP, General Chapter 51, the concentration of an added microbial, antimicrobial preservative can be kept to a minimum if the active ingredients in the formulation possess intrinsic antimicrobial activity. So if you have, you know, certain compounds in there that aren't necessarily antimicrobial, but say you're lowering the water activity by adding some of those other compounds, you may not have to test as extensively as if it's a highly aqueous uh, type of product. So the antimicrobial effectiveness, whether inherent in the product or produced because of addition of the preservative, must be demonstrated for all injections packaged in multi-dose containers or for other products containing antimicrobial preservatives. Uh, as mentioned, must be uh, demonstrated in multi-dose uh, containers, uh, topical and or oral dosage forms. Um, and then also for the purpose of this test, aqueous is defined as water activity more than 0.6. So the microbial challenge test is used to evaluate the effectiveness of the preservative uh, intentionally added at the time of formulation during storage and over a period of use by the consumer. So you, you specific amounts of suitably neutralized product are intentionally inoculated with known amounts of the microorganisms and incubated for up to 28 days. The mortality rates measured at specific intervals and compared to the acceptance criteria. So the ability of the procedure to detect microorganisms in suitably neutralized product to be tested must be established. So you don't want to have matrix effects just killing your microorganisms or not being able to recover the microorganisms. That's why you need to do a challenge test first so, and go through a validation test first. So generally understood if a product possesses antimicrobial properties because of preservative, this and a microbial property must be neutralized to recover viable organisms. The neutralization may be, must, may be achieved by adding neutralizers, dilution, or combination of washing and dilution. And the, the 
the effects of, uh, uh, say, microorganisms, state, the challenge organisms, conditions of the test, et cetera, are all very uh, 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 discussed quite a bit in detail in, in many sources of literature to make sure that it works properly. So basically, if you're neutralizing the uh, uh, product first through chemical dilution or membrane filtration. So these are some common chemical neutralizers that say bisulfite will neutralize mercurials, glutaraldehyde, glycine neutralizes aldehydes, lecithin analyzes the QACs, uh, it neutralizes. So um, that that needs to be uh, established in the laboratory and, and there's many procedures out there talking about neutralizing uh, your samples first. So after you go through the validation, uh, after demonstrating suitability of the test method to overcome antimicrobial activities, the AET test is then performed with the validated method for the products without the neutralization of the, uh, of the antimicrobial activity. So you will then uh, basically spike your samples with known microorganisms, and these are listed in the USP and many other uh, compendial procedures. The Staphylococcus aureus is representative brand positive uh, bacteria. That's common, nasal, cutaneous, microflora, E. coli, uh, fecal contamination, uh, can easily develop resistance to preservatives. You have uh, a filamentous fungi, this Aspergillus brasilia, <laughs> sorry if I mispronounce it, major uh, cause of decomposition and such. So these are the representative uh, bacteria and, and fungi microorganisms that are used for the um, AET test. In addition to those, um, the compendial procedures often recommend using additional uh, uh, microorganisms that represent other processes or facility material manufacturing, such as Burkholdia capacia, which is a pathogen in manufacturing, or Bacillus subtilis, spore-forming bacteria. So the requirements for test organisms are that all cultures must be no more than five passages removed from the original stock culture, as from usually from ATCC in the US. So and the inoculations should be adjusted so that you have about 10 to the eighth colony forming units per milliliter. And the media must be capable, of course, of supporting growth and tested accordingly. So there are different categories uh, for the AET test. Category one type of products are uh, like high risk um, products such as injections, uh, those that are injected directly into your body or or uh, um, in, into your nasal passages or ophthalmic products with aqueous bases, um, those are high risk type of products. A category two, a little bit less risk, um, aqueous bases, non-sterile nasal products including those to mucous membranes. Category three, oral products other than antacids, um, and then category four, antacids. Um, so the procedures are to use five containers or five sterile containers into which sufficient volume of product has been transferred. You inoculate with a small volume of your, uh, of your uh, bacteria or your microorganisms, and then category one through three products should be inoculated at a level of 10 to the five or 10 to the six CFU. Category four should be 10 to the three or 10 to the four CFU. And the criteria that's used for um, evaluating if the AET test is uh, passing or failing are as listed here. So pretty strict criteria. For bacteria, category one, you have not less than one log reduction from the initial calculated count. Um, not more than just mentioning is not more than 0.5 log unit changes. So you also have to show for bacteria category one, not less than three log reduction from initial at the 14 day, um, and no increase from 14 to 28 day, and no increase from initial calculated count at 7, 14, and 28 day for yeast and molds. The requirements are a little bit less stringent for the category two, three, and four uh, types of uh, products. So you could always look at these uh, later. Um, but just want to get back to the outline. We've covered a lot of information. Uh, we've already talked about why they're necessary, definitions, classifications, and analysis. So now we get into some regulation on the use of preservatives in the personal care products in different regions, primarily focusing on USA, Canada, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Um, and and uh, some other parts of the world, China, Brazil, Japan, and some challenges and incentives for new preservatives. So in the US, um, the uh, federal government uh, pretty much oversees the regulation of personal care products 
to a much lesser extent than they do for uh, pharmaceutical products. Um, but it's still uh, described in the US uh, FDA that some personal care products meet the definition of both cosmetics and drugs. For example, a shampoo is a cosmetic because it cleans hair, but an anti-dandruff shampoo uh, contains an active ingredient. Um, so therefore, it's a, a, both a cosmetic and drug because it's to clean hair and treat dandruff. So other types of products are, are that way as well too. But generally, you know, drugs must uh, either receive pre-market approval by FDA or conform to certain regulations, whereas cosmetic products and ingredients are not subject to FDA pre-market approval authority, with the exception of color additives, so that's an interesting thing, and cosmetic firms are responsible for establishing the safety of their products and ingredients before marketing. So it's really up to the manufacturers to be in control of the preservatives and the effectiveness of their products and such. Um, um, other agencies that talk about um, uh, personal care products, fed federal agencies are listed here, um, and other non-federal products, the Personal Care Products Council in the U.S. is a, a, a big uh, entity that um, has a lot of weight in the industry, and a lot of people try to follow the guidelines from Personal Care Products Council um, and decisions from them. Interesting that the FDA has a voluntary cosmetic registration program called the DCRP. Um, it's their program for reporting uh, uh, use by manufacturers, packagers, distributors of cosmetic products that are in commercial distribution in the U.S. Um, the VC RP applies only to cosmetic products sold to consumers, does not apply to products such as being used in beauty salons, spas, or skin care clinics, does not apply to products that are not for sale, such as at hotel free samples, free gifts, or whatever. So it's interesting, you know, that they make that disclaimer. The benefits are that the FDA can essentially, you know, monitor a little bit better the uh, regular uh, in carrying out its responsibility to regulate cosmetics, better to just monitor what's going on. Um, and the information from the VCRP database has been used by Cosmetic Ingredient Review, which is an independently funded panel of scientific experts. So that's an interesting entity. Um, you wonder, you know, what's happening in the U.S., uh, you know, governmental agencies, other government, uh, Congress, uh, very slow to take up any new regulations for personal care products and cosmetics. Um, there's an act from 2017 uh, from Diane Feinstein, you know, that looks at contaminant ingredients, methylene, glycol, formaldehyde, lead acetate, et cetera. That's still stuck in committee uh, after a few years. Another act, um, competing act uh, by Orrin Hatch, that's still stuck in committee. So really can't look to the U.S. Uh, Congress to make much headway there. So it's pretty much going to be more up to industry itself to kind of uh, regulate itself for cosmetics especially. Health Canada um, also is, is very important. Many manufacturers here in the U.S. sell to Health Canada, to, to, to Canadian uh, entities. Um, so, the, the, you know, Health Canada's uh, requirements are also very important uh, to consider. BHA, BHT, um, this is just some of the current status of preservatives. If you look up Regulation of Cosmetics, Health Canada, you'll see these pages. So they're looking at, you know, some of the common preservatives right now and what are some concerns, formaldehyde, BHA, BHT, the parabens <clears throat> have extensive discussion here but essentially saying that uh, there's still safe to use, uh, no clear evidence of, of problems, but uh, there is evidence, you know, in in vitro studies that, you know, is a hormone disruptor. Uh, so uh, parabens are under high scrutiny, um, and at some point they're going to have a, a draft summary for parabens. I looked it up last night, still didn't see anything new on the web, so maybe it's just not posted yet, so we'll see. Triclosan, very common preservative, you know, 5, 10, 20 years ago. Um, they're saying it's still allowable for use in cosmetic products at up to a 0.3% level, um, but it's it's uh, not very common these days, and so kind of being phased out for various reasons, yet uh, it's not necessarily um, been delisted in any uh, entity um, that I know. So, but the regulation of cosmetics by region uh, in Europe, this is really where um, much more scrutiny is being uh, done on uh, use of preservatives for cosmetic products. And the regulation EC num number 1223 is a main 
document relating to the safety of cosmetic products. And again, it's not medicinal products or medical devices or biocidal products, uh, but it is for cosmetics. So um, they list the annexes here for lists of uh, various substances, like say prohibited in cosmetic products, annex two. Annex five here is the uh, list of preservatives allowed in cosmetic products. So that's the, the, the main one that um, everybody looks at when we're talking about preservatives. And new authorizations, prohibitions, restrictions of chemicals are introduced to the regulations through the release of amendments. So this document hasn't changed much since 2009, but there's been various amendments made. And if you look up uh, the EC number 1223, 2009, Annex 5, this is just page one of eight, but it does have an extensive list of the common preservatives. There's 59 that's listed, uh, and, and it talks about the different forms of each preservative, um, as well as the, the CAS numbers, et cetera, and conditions. So it's okay, say, for propionic acid to use it up to 2%. Um, so you would have to read up more about each of these uh, to get better uh, understanding of what's allowed and not allowed uh, per the EC 1223. And, and many manufacturers are following this uh, uh, this type of um, uh, release by the, by the European agency and many other areas of the world are referring to the European agency here for guidances on using preservatives in cosmetic products. So um, I want to talk about the European safety assessment process for cosmetics. So the safety of the annex substances listed here, especially annex five, um, are done in basically a two-part fashion. So the safety of the, of the substances is evaluated by the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety, known as SCCS. But the safety of cosmetic products with all ingredients is evaluated by industry. So it's kind of a two-pronged approach, looking at the active uh, uh, preservatives, et cetera, from the SCCS overseeing that. And then in industry, we're looking at the finished products with mixtures, safety assessor, uh, responsible person, et cetera, then talking about risk management. So it's kind of a two-prong uh, approach. Um, seems to be a, a very good way of, of doing this. Um, currently, there's 59 approved preservatives in Annex 5, but just a limited number are commonly used. Many are facing regulatory review, uh, re-review after a number of years. A few have been added to the list in the last 10 years, so that's a common concern is the list of preservatives that are, you know, acceptable uh, is shrinking um, as many of them are being phased out for one reason or another. So as example, recently there's been some bans on methyl thio, uh, thiazolinones, uh, parabens. Um, the asterisks, if you look these up, you know, it's for certain conditions for certain types of products. So it's not like an outright ban, but but they are being more, more and more restricted um, and banned in certain products. Reasonably restricted propyl and butyl parabens, triclosan, et cetera. <clears throat> Again, that asterisk is important to know which type of products they're talking about. Pending evaluation are the formaldehyde, formaldehyde releasers, timerosol, zinc pyrithrion, et cetera. So um, they're being, uh, uh, you know, heavily scrutinized in the, in the EU. Um, and so uh, that's just very interesting to note that the world kind of looks to the EU here for uh, primary guidances on that. So there's also the uh, Southeast Asian uh, sort of equivalency to the uh, EU regulations, and that's the ASEN. So um, definition of cosmetics by category for cosmetic products. Members are many of these Southeast Asian countries, including Cambodia, Singapore, Philippines, etc., cetera, um, Indonesia. They do have similar annexes, um, uh, kind of like reshuffled and a little bit different prioritizations and such, but Annex 5 lists preservatives, which pro pro cosmetic products may contain. Uh, also preservatives that are provisionally allowed and lists of preservatives allowed by country. They have uh, individual restrictions by, by country and such. So that's kind of interesting. I chose some other random countries of more of the big markets, such as like China. Um, uh, cosmetics are regulated by the National Medicinal Products Administration. So there's a web link here. I don't know how long it's good for, but you can look it up there if you're interested in, in that in the Chinese region. Brazil cosmetics uh, need to be registered with the National 
National Agency of Health Surveillance, ANVISA, which regulates production, import, trade, cosmetics, toiletries. So it's kind of broad scale, but it does include preservatives in their evaluation for personal care products. In Japan, uh, it's a regulated cosmetic product regulated by the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. So these are just some examples. Uh, you can look it up uh, in different regions, different uh, countries, uh, probably get different guidances and such, but a lot of them uh, kind of defer to the EU uh, regulations. So I want to talk about now some challenges for the use of preservatives in cosmetic products. The Basically, the FDA regulatory agencies require that finished products are not toxic to the recipients at the recommended dose. You don't want to be adding so much preservative that it becomes toxic, of course. Uh, preservatives by nature will have an effect on microbial cells, but microbial cells are living entities and, and human cells are also living entities, so there are some similarities uh, with some cells, but there's very different as well too, as many of you know. But uh, So you can start to have some adverse effect on human cells as well too, at certain levels, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, there's concerns with safety of preservatives are numerous, and many, many adverse relationship studies are well cited in the literature. Uh, it just is endless, you can keep uh, researching out many, many different types of toxicology toxicology type studies and, and such. The ability of injected or ingested preservatives to be broken down and remove internal processes uh, is very different than those if you apply to the uh, to the skin or otically or ophthalmologically. So um, that's something to consider. Internal processes, you have your liver and such to help break things down, but on your skin you may not have those kind of mechanisms, so that, that can be different depending on how it's used. So the addition of synthetic or natural, naturally derived preservatives to pharmaceuticals, OTC, and cosmetic products not only is a formulation concern, but public perception concern, of course, and the balance between preservatives preservatives, using preservatives and the risk of contamination must be made, maintained. So, you know, preservative free is not always the best thing uh, because that preservative free product may have a higher risk for contamination, so there's a balance that must be maintained. So the search for new preservatives, um, increasingly formulators are looking for new alternatives. Um, CNE News uh, publication uh, put out in the U.S. for the chemical and engineering uh, industries had a, had a nice article in 2016 on evaluating, uh, scrutinizing the preservatives. Um, without preservatives, generally at 1% or lower, many cosmetic products are susceptible to contamination, which can affect the properties and lead to infections. Alternates to preservatives such as single use or aseptic packaging are unrealistic and increase packaging waste. So if it's a single use application, and you have it, you know, not open before or whatever, and you're just applying it once, that's great. Chances of microbial contamination are very small, but now you got a lot of waste to deal with. So um, that's why most of them are multi-use, but then you open and close them and increase your risk of contamination. Even though a class of preservative has mark of approval from regulatory agencies, the public perceptions may be so strong that the company will just go ahead and remove it just because of a perception issue, such as J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson removing formaldehyde releasing preservatives from many of their products. They just, as a company, decided they're not gonna use that. Revisiting preservatives that were common and considered safe 20 years ago merit re-examination. There's newer technologies out there, new evaluation strategies. So just because it was commonly used before, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's a good one today or even back then. <clears throat> so development of new preservatives require a lot of time, costs, and efforts uh, to obtain regulatory approval and acceptance by formulators and environmental groups. So this is a big challenge in industry right now. CNA News also uh, had an article um, just last year, search for new uh, cosmetic, cosmetic preservatives. So some alternates to preservatives are available, the previous preservatives, and numerous preservatives using foods. I mentioned this food, the differences between food and cosmetics and uh, pharmaceuticals, but now they're under more scrutiny. Certain types of food preservatives, such as benzoyl alcohol, uh, acetylperidinium, or are now becoming more used in personal care products. Preservative boosters, such as Zorbitan, Zorbitan caprolate, can make traditional preservatives, uh, preservatives more effective, which is a good thing. Cosmetic companies are increasingly using blends of traditional preservatives with natural preservatives, such as essential oils and flavonoids. Um, but often, uh, they need to add higher levels of these blends to achieve safety 
of the traditional preservatives. You start using more and more of those blends, and then it starts to affect the product properties. So there's a trade-off. Concerns with long-term exposure, absorption in the skin, metabolism, and accumulation of traditional preservatives as, as apply as well to new preservatives. Just because it's new and natural and doesn't mean it's going to be great. There needs to be studies to show that it's just as effective, if not more so, than the other ones. So um, I just want to kind of give like the updates here in the U.S. There's the Personal Care Products Council that I mentioned earlier. Uh, some of our people here at Bioscreen are active um, members and so they had a uh, uh, recent review of some preservatives such as parabens uh, indicating it's still safe for use uh, but uh, except for benzyl paraben insufficient data to conclude makes some conclusions the mci mi uh, preservatives under review benzyl isothiazolinone phmb uh, etc all being reviewed you know uh, by member contributions and, and concerns and studies that are brought to the to the meetings uh, to reach certain consensus on if anything needs to be uh, banned or restricted. Um, so it's a it's a a great way to stay on top of the industry. Um, also, there's uh, found that there's a GC3, the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council. Um, the GC3 is a cross-sectional, uh, sectoral, full-value chain business membership organization collaborating to uh, enhance green chemistry across all industries, uh, advocate for government policy and funding that advances green chemistry. In 2017, they have different incentive programs. In 2017, one of their industry challenges was to develop new preservatives for personal care and health products and they sought submissions on uh, broad spectrum or single action agents on gram positive bacteria gram negative bacteria yeast and mold uh, preservative boosters also too were in this category that um, they, they would evaluate new preservative boosters um, and the evaluation is based upon uh, certain requirements that these new uh, formula products or new uh, compounds must be active against at least one bacteria mold or yeast pH within between five and eight, maintain formulated product shelf life for two years, withstand freeze thaw cycles, and be effective at concentrations less than two percent. So that's an interesting challenge. But they actually had seven winners um, listed for these type of uh, compounds shown here. And then currently the GC3 is supporting the finalists to uh, work on uh, customer development and commercialization partnerships to. Uh, encourage this type of activity within the industry. And, you know, you can look at the latest press release from Cosmetic Ingredient Review Boards, looking at parabens, having, uh, uh, establishing that, uh, now placing a cap on total parabens not to exceed 0.8% reasons listed uh, for relationship to hormonal activity and other health concerns. It's in a comment period right now. So um, there's always active uh, new new ways of evaluating these products and seeking out uh, new preservatives and, and new uh, regulations on them, new, new uh, restrictions and uh, suggestions for industry to use certain preservatives or others. So uh, this is about the end of my talk, so I'll go ahead and summarize um, preservatives, maybe add it intentionally to pharmaceutical and personal care products to prevent microbial contamination and degradation if primary and secondary controls are inadequate. It's a regulatory requirement that preservatives are shown to be effective and meet various criteria for safe use for pharmaceuticals and uh, personal care products, especially OTC, over-the-counter products with certain actives. Chemical testing can be performed simultaneously as other tests to evaluate the uh, product during the course of a uh, life cycle. Microbial testing, it's essential to show explicitly that the product meets the acceptance criteria for antimicrobial effectiveness for a particular class of drug product and also um, personal care products. Many regions throughout the world have existing regulations for personal care and cosmetic products, yet it's the regulation, the European regulation that is world leader on evaluating and establishing safety guidelines for preservatives. There's ongoing incentives to find safe and effective replacements or additional nature-based preservatives and it's driving innovation for new preservatives and combination products. 
So thank you very much for sticking with me. I know it was a long, intense talk. Many people said this is like Preservatives 101, uh, but I enjoyed that and hopefully it gave you uh, a lot of good background information to refer to later. Um, so if you have any questions, please let us know. I do want to just share some selected references. I gleaned a lot of this uh, from the literature, uh, from various sources. I want to acknowledge that, um, you know, there's a lot of good literature out there. Please uh, look it up if you have any uh, questions coming from this presentation as well. Um, also some uh, acknowledgments from my colleagues here at ALS Global Bioscreen, Renil Fernando, General Manager, Wendy Chang, Operations Director, and Shrita Johnson, Chemistry Manager, who's very familiar with uh, preservative testing. And here's my contact information. So thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll turn this back over to uh, Kelly. Hopefully she's still on the line here. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mitchell. Okay. We will go ahead and uh, open it up for questions. So feel free to use your chat box to yes. ask a question or uh, the raise your hand feature if you want to ask Mitchell a question directly. We'll go ahead and open up for a few minutes to see if any questions come in. We did have a question um, for a hand being raised from Anita, so I will go ahead and unmute you. All right, Anita, if you wanted to go ahead and ask your question to Mitchell, it looks like she is going to type okay. her question. <laughs> okay, good. But we do have a few additional questions coming in. Um, the first question says, when were preservatives first introduced into personal care products? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I didn't really find um, that in my evaluation for this uh, presentation and, and topic. Um, I imagine that certain preservatives were used, you know, quite a few years ago when personal care products first came about. You know, you're probably talking, you know, hundreds of years ago, if not, you know, back in ancient history, people were putting, you know, certain things on their face or skin, you know, even like tattoos and things like that go way, way back. But when they actually started adding preservatives, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there's natural natural products out there, probably like salicylic acid and alcohols that probably people found would uh, enhance the longevity of it and lower the risk for contamination. So it's hard to say, but I would gather that it was probably in the you know 18, late 1800s, early 1900s that uh, some of these uh, early types of uh, personal care products or uh, cosmetic type of products were first started. So uh, I'm sure uh, it became, you know, more commonly referenced in the literature, you know, probably in the start back to the 50s and 60s and such. Um, so hard to say exactly when, but uh, I'm sure it goes way back. Um, you know, the use of alcohol, uh, and not only as a, as a drink substance, but in, in other types of uh, uh, medical uh, types of uh, products and even uh, other type of products applied uh, to skin and, and eyes and whatnot um, has probably been uh, evaluated uh, one degree or another, you know, from tribal knowledge. So we'll just use, you know, this to help uh, keep it uh, active and, and acceptable for use longer. So hard to say, but that's a very good question. We don't have any direct questions after that. I don't see any additional hand raised. So at this time, we will go ahead and close the webinar. I just want to thank everyone again for attending, and thank you, Mitchell, for this oh, you're wonderful welcome. presentation today. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Hey, thank you very much. Take care.